All right, welcome everybody. Um, I'm Sam Burden, Assistant Professor here in Electrical and Computer Engineering, and it's my pleasure to uh, be hosting Professor Aaron Ames. Uh, he's going to be presenting today on uh, his work on safety critical control of dynamic robots. Um, so Aaron is currently a endowed Bren Professor uh, in Mechanical and Civil Engineering and CDS, which is this special control and dynamical systems program down at Caltech. Uh, sunny Pasadena, California. Um, but before that, so he he started off his uh, academic trajectory um, double majoring in mechanical engineering and math at University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota. And then he came to Berkeley and got a master's in math and a PhD in ECS. Um, and then was at Caltech as a postdoc for a couple of years uh, in CDS, so the same program that he's now returned to. Um, he went to Texas A&M started as an assistant professor, moved to Georgia Tech before finally returning to Caltech, kind of closing that full loop. Um, he's won numerous awards as a PhD student, uh, this really prestigious Leon Chua Award for nonlinear science from Berkeley, um, and, the, and a uh, Bernard Friedman Memorial Prize in Applied Math for his, his math masters. Um, he's received the NSF Career Award recently, or well, I guess it's not so re recently now, I'm looking at the date, but anyway, a few years ago, uh, he received this Ekman Award. Uh, so for people who are, this is kind of inside baseball for control theorists, but this is essentially, a, you know, the, the Fields Medal for Control Theorists. This is the highest uh, award that you can receive as an American working in this field. Uh, really, really outstanding. And then I see recently uh, uh, Antonio Roberti Young Researcher Prize um, for his work in systems and control. So Aaron started, you know, as you could see from the bio, started off in uh, uh, some very theoretical areas, you know, master's and PhD thesis on category theory, which is a pretty abstract branch of mathematics, um, but especially starting as a faculty member and then continuing, you know, his trajectory through uh, returning to Caltech, he's really built up an immense uh, experimental infrastructure, and he's worked in a number of application domains involving autonomous robots, dynamic robots, always kind of centered around things with legs, things that are highly nonlinear, things that could potentially be unsafe and developing, uh, you know, kind of fun making fundamental contributions to um, analytical techniques, computational techniques, and then and then demonstrating on physical hardware. So really excited to hear from Aaron. Um, uh, so, you know, let's give him our warm Zoom welcome. Thank you, Sam. Thanks for the wonderful introduction. Uh, it was fantastic. Uh, and thank you for having me here virtually. Uh, I wish I could be there in person. I, I love the University of Washington. I love Seattle. It's really a special place. It's beautiful. Every time I go there, it's stunning. So uh, hopefully in the not too distant future, I'll be able to visit in person. Uh, but in the meantime, I get to talk to you virtually, which, which I'm looking forward to. Uh, as Sam mentioned, my trajectory sort of went through theory and math and, and then got to experiments. But uh, there's a lot of theory still here under the surface, and this talk is really about that coupling between theory and the experiments. Uh, but before starting, it's important to thank everyone that really made this talk. I mean, you'll see a lot of experimental videos in this talk, and a lot of theory too, uh, and I couldn't do it without this huge uh, uh, group of collaborators, both my grad students and postdocs, along with, you know, collaborators at other universities, some of which you, you'll note, like Ruj Nabaichi, who who brought me in and, and got me to start doing experiments to begin with, for example. Uh, so, so with that being said, let's, let's start with uh, the motivation. And the motivation is that robots are hard. Uh, I always say to my students, hardware has hard in it for a reason. It's, it's always going to throw you through a loop. And, and this is us trying to get a robot to run. And these are outtakes of it trying, trying to get it to run over a nine-month period, nine months just again and again and again. And we felt like we were so close. You see here, it looks like it's about to run and then it would fall, it would just, we couldn't get more than a couple steps. And we just kept hammering this, hammering this, hammering this, thinking if, well, we're one, you know, game tuning away from getting this thing to finally get. And, and what we realized and what, what we had to sort of do is step back and say, wait, wait, hitting this with the same hammer over and over again is not going to make it better, right? That's the definition of insanity, right? Doing the same thing again and again and expecting a different result. So what did we have to do? We had to go back to the drawing board and step away from the, the hardware and say, let's study this from the math perspective. Let's get back and, and get to what we know. And so it turns out that by, by studying what was happening theoretically, we discovered that what we needed to invoke was rather than just control the optimal functions, which I'll talk about here, we had to use input to state stability concepts coupled with control the optimal functions. And once we made that connection, that theoretical connection, we got it to run in three days. And it ran just, just about right out of the box. 
And that really tells you this, this feedback loop and why it's so important. And what the feedback loop I mean is not in, on the hardware itself. I mean the feedback loop between theory and practice and why it's important to understand that connection. And that hints at the broader scope of really everything I'm interested in, which is bridging this gap. So on one end, we have theorems and proofs, and these are hugely important to understand the basic fundamental mechanisms of what we're trying to achieve. On the other hand, we have getting that stuff on hardware. And, and it's in that process that we really discover where the theory is incomplete, where the theorems don't cover important things. And the idea is to rather than just try to hack this together, close this loop, bridge this gap. So develop new theory so that every time we have a theorem, we can put it right on the hardware and it works right out of the box. So that's sort of my dream scenario is from theorem to hardware instantly. And so, so let's talk about this, but in a broader context of a bunch of applications and, and see how this all fits together with a bunch of different theory uh, coupled. So in particular, I wanna talk about things from robotic systems all the way to robotic assistant devices. So there's this long arc that you'll see throughout the talk. And in the middle, really the important thing I've done a lot of work on recently is this idea of safety critical control. And that might seem sort of discongruent between walking robots and robotic assisted devices and then safety critical control in the middle. But it turns out it's kind of the glue that's put all these things together and, and helped us really understand at a deep theoretic level what's going on below the surface. So I'm going to start with robotic systems uh, because it gives us some context for the theory we're going to develop. In particular, I'm going to start with sort of the original theory, the origin story, if you'd like, of, in my mind, nonlinear control, which is Lyapunov. And so Lyapunov dates all the way back to 1892. And the variant I'm going to talk a lot about is control Lyapunov functions from 1989. Um, but the concepts are really analogous and, and they're really deep. And it, I always say, I think you can teach nonlinear control in about five minutes. And all you have to do is describe Lyapunov theory. And that gives you a sense of all of nonlinear control. And so let me let me kind of talk about this in a second conceptually. Uh, and by the way, a lot of this is 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 motivated by the viewpoints I gained from category theory, just to give a shout out to my PhD, even if it's not explicitly here. So the idea is the following. We have a dynamical system. We have x dot equals f of x. And this can be a really high dimensional system, 50 dimensions, 100 dimensions. And we want to certify a property on the system, let's say stability. So we want to have this system converge to the origin x equals 0, let's say. So how do we do that? How do we approach this complicated system with all these nonlinearities? It turns out. All we have to do is sort of change our perspective and say, what happens if we can synthesize a function V? And so this function, if it looks kind of like a bowl, then we know that at the bottom of the bowl is our stable or the equilibrium point we want to make stable, right? And, and as long as this V function decreases along solutions of our nonlinear system in the proper way, we're guaranteed that we're going to reach the bottom of the bowl. So I always, the analogy here is this coin game where you put a coin into this little thing and they, they converge to the bottom. You know they're going to converge to the bottom because of their direction at any given time is going to be pointing sort of in the right, uh, the right direction, and that's to the bottom. And so the way to quantify this mathematically is to say, let's take this function V, this, this positive definite function, and let's make sure it's decaying along solutions according to V dot less than or equal to minus alpha V. And, and this is really capturing the fact that we want our nonlinear system to behave like a stable linear system, a stable one-dimensional linear system. Uh, and if that's true, and now the inequality adds, adds something to this, but if that's true, then V will converge exponentially. And because V is positive definite, that's bounded by these things, we know that X will converge exponentially to zero. Not only do we know that, but we actually have something even more general we can say. We can say that if there exists an input that's, that satisfies this derivative condition on V, then there's in fact a family of controllers that will stabilize our system. That is any U in our set of admissible control inputs that satisfies this derivative condition on V. When we apply that U, we're going to get exponential stability in X. So this entire family of controllers. Uh, and importantly, once we understand that there's that family of controllers, we can do things like prove stability of the system we're interested in. So in particular, this theorem I'm showing up here, which I'm not really expecting you to, I mean, I haven't defined everything in this theorem too here, but this theorem is actually from a, a tech paper I had in 2014 that implies stability of walking, that is stable periodic orbits, effectively using these ideas. So once we have this theorem, we can also synthesize controllers. 
So note that we said any controller in this set of admissible control inputs, it turns out that we can just look to find the best controller in that set of admissible control inputs. That is, we can say, let's frame this as it turns out this is a quadratic program. Let's frame it as minimizing the difference between some desired controller we have sitting out there that may or may not be stable, subject to this constraint on the derivative of your Lyapunov function. And it turns out that V dot, this derivative of V along solutions is that fine in your control input if your dynamics are fine, your nonlinear dynamics. It's a single scalar inequality. And it not only that, but this QP has a closed form solution. So what we've effectively done is said, we, we want to stabilize the system. We come up with a certificate of stability V. Once we have this, not only do we prove stability of the system, but we can synthesize controllers that stabilize the system. And this Segway video here is showing this QP running on the Segway in real time stabilizing this upright. So spending a second on this theorem though, once we have these theorems, we can also encode these theorems on hardware. So, so then some of this is just kind of a historic shout out. These were the first robots we ever got to walk in my lab. Uh, and that's codifying this theorem here. Uh, one more example is on this Duras robot. This is the same robot that was running earlier in the talk, but now it says a walking robot. And again, all of these work, meaning we can take this theorem we can write the conditions of th this theorem as constraints in essence. We can put that in, let's say, F min con in, math, math, in MATLAB and then generate these stable gates from the theorem. The one, the one problem we had there was that that computationally was a mess. So the final point I wanna make about this process of translating the hardware is the role of algorithms and how important it is to algorithmically encode your mathematics in a smart way. And so to this end, one of my uh, former PhD students, now a professor at Ohio State, developed this toolbox Frost, and you can download it yourself from GitHub and play with it if you want. And what this does is takes this theorem in essence, and, and in a computational, uh, computationally efficient way using collocation methods, uh, generates stable gates using that math. And, and we can generate these stable gates really quickly because we got smart with how we encoded this theorem at, in an algorithmic form. In particular, we can generate gates, for example, for a full humanoid robot, a stable walking gate in about three to four minutes. So three to four minutes from theorem to hardware, fairly cleanly, in fact. So it's not just limited to, this, this was in the lab back in the day. This is one more example of this theorem encoded on the hardware itself. And I should note, I'm not gonna talk about it here, but, but part of this was not only modeling the nonlinear dynamics, but it's actually a hybrid dynamical system. It has four discrete domains. Every time the feet change contact with the ground, you get different dynamics governing the system. And we factor all of that in into this theoretical framework we, we developed. Uh, and the end result is this multi-contact walking on a humanoid robot. And still one of the favorite walking behaviors we've achieved on a robot because it does this very natural human-like walking with the feet where we get a heel strike, toe strike, toe roll, just like people do when they walk. And the other thing to note is that there's actually springs in the ankles here. So this is a highly underactuated system that we're able to handle by studying the full nonlinear dynamics of the system. The one thing about this, and this is an older video, this is when I was at Georgia Tech, is that we got this to work a couple times for a couple minutes. And so there is a big difference between getting this singular behavior sort of one time and getting this repeatedly. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that, that repeatability aspect, that robustness aspect uh, as we go on. But first, let me just note that because these concepts developed were really general, we can apply them to a lot of different application domains. So it turns out we recently applied the same theory and the same mathematical framework to quadrupeds. So in this case, what we're doing is saying, there's been a lot of work on quadrupedal locomotion, very good work. But in our case, we're saying, let's view a quadruped as two bipeds that are interacting through the torso. So it's like a collaboration uh, between two bipeds that interact again, like two people holding a table and moving it around. And by doing that, we can generate walking gates for each of the bipeds individually in like two seconds, because these are lower dimensional systems that have some nice structure because of this interaction force. So literally two seconds from the gate generation from the theorem to the hardware. And we did this repeatedly. So we just generate new gates and then pop them on the hardware. So that's a cool application of the theory. Um, because it's a quadruped, it's actually fairly robust. So I'm just showing a little bit of it walking over uh, this root system at Caltech that's kind of our make or break root system, if you'd like. It's a really deep, it's like four inches deep at different spots. And here you can see the robot actually gets some air time because it's navigating these roots. And it's again, important to mention that this is just a single gate we put on this. This is no 
it's not actively sensing the root and reacting to it. This is just a robustness of the gate we generated. By the way, I was filming this and the robot turned on the root and came right to me. And I thought this was maybe the moment when robots decided to take me out. Uh, it got that close and then my students, he stopped it. But it was, it was a little terrifying. Um, in addition to, to, the, to the gate generation side, the, the theorem I mentioned, I also mentioned Lyapunov controllers. And that's sort of the online optimization part of the problem. And we've recently, like very recently, like three weeks ago, realized the, the CLF QPs on quadrupeds as well. So this is running this control the up and off function based controllers on the, on the quadruped view that is two bipeds collaborating. And we get even more robustness because our controller is now better. Uh, and we're able to handle this, this uncertain terrain uh, really robustly. So, so that shows the application of these ideas to different domains um, outside of bipeds. Of course, on the biped front, again, the fact that we have a theorem really gives us this implication of generality. So, so just kind of returning to this basic theorem I use as this, this sur surrogate for all the math we've developed, we can apply this to the CASI bipedal robot. So this was developed, this robot is built by Agility Robotics. And, and in this case, you'll see it has a very different morphology than the Duras robot I showed earlier. The legs are inverted. It has compliance too. It has springs, leaf springs in the, in the knees right here, these four bar linkages. It, it's a really complicated robot, but we're able to take those entire nonlinear dynamics of the system fold them up into the mathematical framework we developed and generate these stable walking gates. And the, and the important thing is we've gotten now where, where instead of with Duras, we got it to work a couple of times and it looked awesome, but a couple of times. Now with Cassie, we can consistently get walking that's robust all the time. And so robust, we don't even need a boom anymore or a tether. We can even send it on things like rough terrain and it can walk on dirt and, and other sort of unknown terrain, all with the single gate we generated, meaning our gates have gotten progressively more robust. Hey, Aaron. Of course, there's- Sorry, sorry can I interject? Um, Eric had asked this question sure. when you were talking about Duras, but I think it's relevant now. Uh, he asked, with respect to Duras, is it robust to different brands of shoe? So to, <laughs> to your point about, you know, what's the difference with, maybe, maybe a more general question is like, what's the difference between Duras and Cassie? Or what's the difference between the algorithms or both um, that's yeah. made this so much more robust? That's right. So I, I think that's a great question. So to the question on Duras, yes, it was actually dependent on the shoe. Meaning we first went out and bought running shoes and put them on Duras and it totally was a disaster because the compliance in the running shoe, the squishiness added this whole nother spring to the system that destabilized it. So then we went out and bought these Adidas with this sort of really thick or really non-compliant sole and then it worked much better. So yes, in this case, it was shoe dependent on Duras, meaning that's how little our robustness window was. I will note one thing, the only other robot to really walk really nicely with, with shoes was probably Boston Dynamics uh, robot uh, back in the day, Petman. And it also was shoe dependent. It, it, they were rock climbing shoes. So again, very little compliance in the sole. The interesting story here is that they had size 13 for their robot and Duras also wore size 13. So it seems like size 13 is the operative thing to getting a robot to walk with shoes, just, just in case you're, you're thinking about trying this out. Um, no, but in all seriousness, what's different with Cassie was Duras was great, but Duras was sort of a custom built one-off robot. And there was a lot of things in it that we needed to improve to get robustness. One, one thing to note, for example, is the frame itself had quite a bit of compliance because of all the weight. And so that caused a lot of issues where the, the, the entire frame would bend and oscillate. So Cassie was built by, by Jonathan Hurst and his company. And it's much more sort of professional platform. They're actually selling it. And so it had a lot less of that sort of uncertainty in it that Duras had, which gave you more robustness. It was also built to fall and get back up. And, and so there's a lot of reasons why Cassie let us take these ideas further than we did with Duras. Uh, and you'll see, this is actually all the videos I'm showing are examples of where we've taken it. We can, we can jump, we can walk, we can follow paths. We can do a whole bunch of cool stuff with, with Cassie uh, that we couldn't do before. Um, and so with all that being said, though, there's still limits to what we can do with Cassie. It's not like I don't want to paint a picture that there's nothing that it can go over any terrain and just be fine. So this is that same root system I showed earlier. And you'll note that Cassie wipes out. So it can actually handle the root system quite well. It does a good job. It just gets to a point here where it turns out that the, what happened was the legs hit each other. So there was a self um, collision that caused it to destabilize. So the point I'm making there is that there's something we need that's more general than just stability. 
because the legs hitting each other is not a stability concept really, right? It's not doing that because it's unstable. It's doing that because it's entering into a region that's bad. And so this leads to barrier functions. And so the idea here is on robotic systems in general, again, per this falling you saw in Cassie, we need to extend our notions of stability beyond just, or our notions of sort of safety and stability beyond just converging to a point. And so the idea here is to generalize to sets and not just stability of sets, but rather set invariance. And so the concept of set invariance actually goes way back to. So it turns out in 1942, Nagumu discovered this, uh, these necessary and sufficient conditions for set invariance. Uh, and those have since been rediscovered many times. It turns out Nagumo's paper was sort of lost to the world many times. And it probably is, is not coincidental. It was in 1942 and the world was undergoing a lot of sort of bad stuff around that time. But, but it was rediscovered many, many times. And, and let me sort of describe his conditions and, and then our extensions of those conditions. So his conditions, and, and I'm going to frame them a little bit simpler than he did, but the, the ideas are really the same. So we start with a dynamical system x dot equals f of x, and we define a safe set now. So now we have a set we want to render forward and vary. And the set is defined as the super level set of h. That is, the set is defined as all the values where h is greater than or equal to zero. What that means is the boundary of that set is h equals zero. h negative describes any region outside of that set. So here I'm showing an ellipse defined by this, by this function here. Okay. And, and the question we asked is the following. So it turns out what Nagumo's theorems did, it was said on the boundary of your set, if h dot is greater than or equal to zero, you'll, your set will be forward invariant. And that makes a lot of sense. If on the boundary, h dot is increasing or zero, it means that the value of h has to either increase or stay zero, which means that you're going to stay inside your set. That's great. That, that, that's true. It works. The problem we asked is from a control theory perspective, how do we use that information? And the problem is if you only know conditions on the boundary of your set, what do you do in the middle of the set? Now you could say, well, I'm going to do anything I want in the middle. And when I hit the boundary, I'll switch to some new controller. But when do you switch and how? And how do you make sure that's robust, right? So the question we asked in 2014-ish was, can we do something that's like control Lyapunov functions, but now for these forward invariant sets? And more specifically, we asked the question, what is the Lyapunov-like condition, if you'd like, this derivative condition on the entire set C that will guarantee that you stay within that set? And that led to this notion of a control barrier function. Again, terrible name. I, I named it. I take full accountability. I called it barrier functions because it was a shout out to barrier functions and optimization and barrier certificate and a whole bunch of stuff. But this is actually a different concept than had historically been present. And the difference is really in this inequality. So what this says is the following. It says that if this, if your derivative along solutions, h dot, satisfy this inequality, you, you actually have necessary and sufficient conditions for, for the set C, defined as a super level set of h, to be forward invariant. That is, there's no better conditions out there, quote unquote, which is a first really important condition because it means you've minimized conservativeness of this condition. The second important thing to note is that even though this looks a lot like Lyapunov, it's actually really different. It not, it's actually the same and different all, all together. What I mean, it's different as the following. H can be both positive, negative. Gamma is a class K function that is over the entire reals now. So think about it as a constant, if you'd like. And what this condition says is inside of my set, H is positive. So this term becomes negative. So now with Lyapunov, you typically say H dot being greater than or equal to zero. Here, H dot is greater than or equal to a negative number. That is H dot can decrease inside the set. H dot decreasing means you can approach the boundary. But as you approach the boundary, this term becomes smaller and smaller until ultimately when you hit the boundary, this would become zero. And it turns out that that condition guarantees you won't overshoot, that is leave your set, and at the same time gives you sort of maximal flexibility within your set, right? And that's a really important consideration when it comes to control of synthesis. Because now we have these sort of less evasive conditions, minimally evasive conditions, in fact, on safety, and we can check them via a quadratic program like we did with Lyapunov functions. That is, we can look at this H dot condition and say, I want to find an input such that I'm as close as possible to some existing input. That is, you give me a controller, maybe that controller is stable, maybe it's my walking controller for Cassie, and I want to filter it. I want to run it through a safety filter so that I guarantee I'm safe while minimally modifying that controller you gave me. And so the minimal modification is in the cost. 
and the safety constraint is given by uh, H dot being greater than this inequality. And again, just like with Lyapunov functions, this is actually because we have an affine system or we're assuming an affine system, this can be solved in closed form. So there's a really nice solution to this. This is, this is a quadratic program and really easy to solve and can be written as a conditional statement. And the conditional statement really tells you what's happening here. You're taking your desired input and if it's safe, you do nothing. And if it's not safe, you minimally modify it. This is just sort of your, it's like a, a pseudo inverse projection onto the sort of the safe control space, if you like. And so the way this looks in practice is as follows. So here's a segue and the segue is running a PD controller. The PD controller works fine to keep it upright. So that's our you desired. And then my student here comes and kicks it. And the PD controller overshoots and then causes it to crash. Well, if we instead pass that PD controller through the barrier function, we're going to stay within our safe set, which is defined as the, as the pendulum being within plus or minus 15 degrees. So effectively, we enforce safety on top of the stability condition that our nominal controller had in practice. So that's the way it works. Um, I want to make one more important philosophical point, though, because I, I get this question a lot. Well, aren't barriers just Lyapunov functions and vice versa? It turns out, no. It turns out that Barrier functions are, in fact, more general than Lyapunov functions. Uh, more concretely, Lyapunov, meaning the, cl the, the class of all Lyapunov functions, meaning take all your Lyapunov functions, effectively, they're defined by barrier functions on a point. That is, Lyapunov functions are the point version of barrier functions, if you'd like. Uh, and, and, and more generally, you can, you can prove this quite simply. Uh, even when you're talking about Lyapunov functions on sets, barrier functions are also more general. Uh, and that's really comes down to the fact that that barrier functions no longer are required to be positive definite, if you'd like. So in, in essence, Lyapunov functions are defined as functions that operate on the positive reals, while barrier functions uh, operate on the entire reals. So that extension to the entire real line gives you a lot more flexibility in terms of how you can invoke those conditions. Um, so, so I just want to make that philosophical point because I think it's important you get this embedding. That's again back to my category theory days. That that's sort of this is a categorical concept of the class of Lyapunov functions sit as a special case of the class of barrier functions. Okay, with with the philosophy out of the way, let me talk about some applications now because then th this is where things get interesting. Uh, so I'm going to jump through a bunch of applications with barrier functions, um, and, and I'll kind of just this is all done to highlight. The, the, the way in which they can be implemented on a variety of different application domains. So I want to start with the sort of simplest application. It turns out this was the application for which barrier functions, control barrier functions were invented, which is automotive systems. Uh, and, and we were actually part of an NSF project, me, Jesse Grizzle, Paulo Tabuada, and, and we were given this sort of challenge problem by, by, the, by Ford and Toyota. And it's a really simple problem, but really elegant because in this case, let's take adaptive cruise control. You're driving your car, your car's being driven at some constant speed, but then there's a car in front of you that's going slower. You need to slow down. How do you mitigate that or balance the, that control objective go 70 miles per hour with the fact that the car in front of you might be going 40? So it turns out this is a really natural interpretation in barrier functions where now your control objectives that teach this desired speed are you desired and your, your safety constraint, don't hit the car in front of you, is your barrier function. Similar concept with lane keeping. So here you want to stay in your lane. So the barrier function is defined by your lane. And then your you desired can be the person driving. So you can let the person do anything they want as long as they won't take the car out of the lane. Uh, and so we've done this on little mobile platforms, but this is actually both of these ideas have been realized on full scale cars and trucks. So this is um, this is lane keeping. This is actually not my work. It's my postdoc, Yushao Chen, who did this at Michigan. Notably, this is not California. This is MCD at Michigan. And so on the right is, is, is Yushao trying to steer the car out of the lane. And on the left is the steering wheel being controlled by a control barrier function. And it's modulating that input of the, the human, the you desired, to make sure that the car, this block here, always stays within the lane which is what defines the barrier function. And this works even with the high, high nonlinearities of the car and the ice on the road and everything else. The other application is to adaptive cruise control. So in this case, we're applying it to trucks. So the truck here is running uh, its own adaptive cruise control. And it turns out that we, we were able to find, this is with Gabor at Michigan, 
um, that you can violate safety on the truck, meaning this adaptive cruise control doesn't necessarily work under every circumstance. And here, these are offset on lanes, so they don't actually collide, but this would have been a collision. Obviously, the truck would have taken out the van. Now, if we apply control barrier functions to this as a safety filter, we're actually able to guarantee safety of the truck and that it won't collide in front. And that's exactly what happens here as certified by the bear function always being positive. So those are two applications of these ideas in action. This speaks to a more general sort of uh, application domain, which is multi-robot systems. Just think about this, there's a lot of cars on the road now. And so working with Magnus Eggerstadt at Georgia Tech, we did a lot of work on this, on this front, uh, especially in the context of the Robotarium. If you, if you haven't heard of it, you can go online and, and play with it. It's a mobile robot test bed that you can put your code on. And the first consideration we, we had when we were thinking about this was, how do we make sure that people don't put their code on these little mobile robots and have them collide? And so the idea was let's put barrier functions on. So the barrier function here is an admissible region around the robots. And in this case, the desired controller I'm gonna show is go straight, meaning all the robots were told to go right at each other. So they all would have collided simultaneously. And instead what happens is they start doing this go straight command until they get close enough for the barrier functions to take over. So at this point, the control barrier function is active for all of these robots. And this is purely a reactive behavior. That is, there's no planning here. There's no, you should go left, I should go right. This is just all the robots sort of moving relative to the barrier function to, to be safe. Lest you think that this is only works for sort of ground robots with wheels, it turns out we did the same thing for uh, drones. And in this case, we have a graduate student driving this drone. And these other drones are sort of on autopilot. And he's trying to crash into the other drones. And of course, the only thing that's preventing this collision is a barrier function on all of the different drones. I mean, every drone has its own barrier function and that's preventing collision between any two drones. And you see here, we're actually using the nonlinear dynamics of the system and you can see a lot of that nonlinear reactiveness uh, in, the, in the behavior you get on the back end. So let me, let can me speak can to Can I ask one. a question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. How do you know when, and I, maybe I missed this, but if you were to define a barrier function and not be careful, you could, for example, disconnect the domain on which the the op and off function is defined, in which case, like, you don't even get reachability or something anymore, right? Like, what is the condition that says this is a barrier function that, that will continue to allow, or that somehow stabilizes anything anymore? Yeah, so, so this is a great question. Um, so, First, there's no guarantee that your barrier function will maintain stability, at least as I'm showing it here. Here, everything I'm doing is sort of purely reactive. So you desired, it, it could be your st stabilizing controller, it could be anything, and the barrier function is purely safety. So, so at this point, I've decoupled the problem. So, so when you add a, a safety um, behavior with a stability behavior, you get a unpredictable emergent behavior. Potentially, yes, that's exactly right. Now, there are ways to mitigate this. So you could add a, a second constraint. In fact, we've done this many times. You could add a CLF constraint to this QP, uh, and then you would have stability and safety. The problem is you can't guarantee that both of those are solvable. If you just add a CLF constraint, you might actually get infeasibility. And that infeasibility would exactly tell you that your stability condition is not compatible with your safety condition, right? And so then you have to relax, let's say, your stability condition, but then you might go unstable. So, so that intersection of stability and safety requires consistency between the conditions, right? Which isn't necessarily guaranteed. Great question. Right. Um, so, so going back to just safety for the moment, um, and you'll see some stability plus safety stuff later, but for just safety, this is, this is one more example. Although there's this stability, of course, here you desired is some onboard controller for the drone. But I wanted to just spend a minute talking about obstacle avoidance because, again, the other question I get a lot talking about barriers is, is that's great, but we've been doing obstacle avoidance forever. We've done potential fields since the 1980s. How is this any different? So, so this is obstacle avoidance in its cleanest form. This is a drone. This is not, this tether here is a safety tether. It's not holding it up. And this is all onboard sensing too. So everything is done onboard. And here the barrier function is don't hit the wall in front of you. Um, so this is and this is a barrier function making sure that that's true and as soon as the walls moved away the the, the drone can go forward uh so the first thing i want to note or the main thing i want to note is it turns out that potential fields if you're familiar with potential fields are actually also a special case of barriers 
Um, meaning if you define potential fields in this way, if you're familiar with it, this is sort of a general definition of potential fields, and you can synthesize a barrier function from a potential field. The converse is not true, um, meaning a potential field gives you a specific example of a barrier. And then also we did this, this is a recent paper we just submitted, but we did this exhaustive comparative analysis of potential fields versus barriers and found that in fact, barriers perform better because they optimally balance your, your attractive potential with your repulsive potential, if you'd like. Um, so I think that's just an important sort of historical note on how this fits in the broader picture of, of, of collision avoidance on, on mobile robots. Uh, and I'm just showing one more video of, of the barrier functions in action with a human driving the drone, just kind of hitting the point home that here the human again is trying to cause a collision with these walls and the barrier function is preventing it. Uh, and it works quite robustly, even with onboard sensing. Okay, so let me take a step back for a second. Uh, and I'm gonna talk about another issue with this that, that I'm sure people might be thinking about, which was, okay, this is great, but this requires a model of your system. And if that model's wrong, how do you know that safety will still be guaranteed? And so I, I just wanna spend a minute talking about this and the fact that if you have unknown dynamics in your system, those will show up as unknown, sort of an unknown component of the derivative of your variable. And so in essence, before you had this perfect world with an H dot being greater than minus alpha H or gamma H, and now you have this additional residual term. And that residual term can cause you to go unsafe because it could, it could negatively impact your ability to understand what's happening at this derivative level. So, so this is the place now where things like learning and adaptive control can play a role. Uh, we actually have a paper on adaptive control with barriers. I'm not going to talk about that, but with learning, the idea is, is very similar, which is we have this unknown residual term. What we can do is actually learn this term episodically from data. So we, we run experiments, we look at this corresponding derivative, uh, and we look at the derivative we expect to get and the one we're actually getting on hardware, meaning the one we're observing, and we try to bridge that gap. That is, we try to learn the HR dot so that, that, that what we expect and what we get is actually the same thing. And so we've been able to effectively do this on, again, the Segway, which is our sort of uh, quintessential platform. And so without learning, uh, unknown dynamics in the system caused you to violate the safety constraints. It still stayed upright, but you get these violations. And when you learn these residual terms, you can actually accommodate for that uncertainty in the model uh, and make sure you're safe, even subject to that uncertainty. Um, sort of more broadly speaking, you can start to think about uncertainty at lots of levels, not just the model, but in the sensing and the interaction at every single level. And, and so at the top, you're seeing a control barrier function running with all of with a whole bunch of uncertainty injected into the system. While on the bottom, we're starting to accommodate for all that uncertainty in many ways using learning, but we can also use other robust sort of input to state uh, safety type concepts to accommodate all this uncertainty in the system. So the point I'm making is that this is a great framework, but there's a lot of open problems. Uh, and I'm just sort of touching on on the main theory, but there's a lot of places for really deep theory, uh, including the theory that Eric pointed out, which is how do you formally balance stability plus safety in this context, right? So here, obviously, at some point, we definitely violate stability, right? Um, meaning that the safety constraints and the uncertainty cause you to, to go absolutely unstable. Okay, so, so let me kind of close now with a little bit broader viewpoint. So everything I've done up to this point really lived at this lowest level. So we use control barrier functions at this low level actuator sort of control to guarantee safety. The problem is that in, in real sort of, let's think about autonomy, there's gonna be a lot more layers to the system and a lot different time scales that you'll have to accommodate for. That is in a real system you're gonna put out in the real world, you're gonna have this low level, you're also gonna have a mid level sort of a trajectory planning level that plays the role of, let's say, the optimization I, I showed earlier in this in the in the talk, but it also plays the role of, let's say, MPC for, for those that like MPC, which generates a trajectory over some time frame. Then finally, you have a decision making layer, a planning layer. Uh, so, so let me start with this mid level and the low level and talk about how we can start to integrate those. So because the goal is to make sure that we have safety across all layers if we're really going to go to a time. So at the MPC layer, it turns out you can actually bring things like CLFs and barriers together in the context of, of sort of safe model predictive control, if you'd like. So what you can do is, is take these constraints. So this is effectively 
uh, a sort of a, a no time horizon MPC, but for full nonlinear dynamics, while MPC might be for some linear dynamics over a longer horizon. And so you can kind of bring those concepts together into a single unified quadratic program if you, if you set it up properly. And, and the end result is you actually can improve performance by integrating both MPC with CLFs. And this is just a, a block showing all these different control things instantiated in different forms where we comparatively analyze the difference between just doing a CLFQP, meaning no MPC, and just doing an MPC and any combination thereof. And this speaks to kind of the broader trajectory. And this is, this is something we just submitted a week ago. Um, but I think this really points out where we're going at a, at a more conceptual level in terms of safety and legged robots. So this is barrier functions on a legged robot for the purposes of walking on stepping stones. So in this case, these stepping stones are your safety critical constraint. And you wanna make sure that as the robot's walking around, its feet always land on a stepping stone. So what we do is we implement barriers at both at two levels, both the MPC level, we have a control barrier function, and then we also have a control barrier function at the real-time control level. It turns out those layered safeties considerations come together to give you really robust behavior. So again, we're able to realize this experimentally and walk on these stepping stones using these concepts. So I, I'll just let this play for one second because I think it's really cool. And there's a lot of dynamics happening, by the way. The stones are moving around as you step on them. There's, there's a lot of very uh, non-trivial things happening. It's able to walk really robustly on these stepping stones. Okay, so that was kind of the mid to, 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 the mid to low layer, starting to understand that interaction. The final layer I want to just discuss briefly is, is this highest decision layer, because I think this is a really important layer to consider. Um, and so the motivation here at the highest layer is at, at some point you have to think about how you're going to sort of plan a mission, let's say. And here by mission, I mean maybe exploring Mars. So actually a lot of these considerations started work uh, with work with JPL. And the, and the motivation specifically was a Mars 2020 mission where you have a helicopter and a rover collaborating on Mars. And the question becomes at this highest decision making level, how do you interact, how do you, how do you handle the interaction between these multi robots, these different robots in a safe way that achieves your goal. And the first approach you might take is, is via a Markov decision process. And this is what we did. So we came up with an MDP that sort of at a high discrete level represented this mission of exploring Mars. And in this case, our Rover was a Segway. And this is our, our, um, our, our Mars helicopter, if you'd like. And we're able to do this autonomous exploration of Mars inside a little lab and, you know, obviously a very special scenario, but we're able to actually have these, the, the, these things work together and coordinate autonomously to explore Mars, right? So this is cool and, and this was a nice application, but the problem is that when we were doing that, we realized how important safety is and the interaction between the layers, uh, how safety shows up everywhere and how it can be violated everywhere. So this is a, a video I actually took during one of the experiments. Unfortunately, I didn't catch the crash. It ultimately flew into the wall and broke into a million pieces. But what happened here is there was a time delay that started propagating through the motion capture system we were using, which caused this instability, which messed up our ability to achieve the objective. So the point of this is that we need to integrate safety at every layer. And that's what motivates this idea of unifying between layers in a safety critical context. That is, once that started happening, we realized we had to visit this problem from the perspective that we had at the lowest layer. So at the lowest layer, we had this safety critical controllers and control barrier functions as dictated by some continuous dynamics. At this top layer, at the mission planning layer, we had these discrete representations of the system and its evolution, right? This is an MDP, let's say. And we wanna use control barrier functions to unify between these different layers. And so the idea is, Rather than just doing MDPs, we want to factor in this uncertainty in some way. So we used palm DPs, partially observable Markov decision processes, which add this sort of stochastic element to our sensing, our observations, our transitions between different sort of discrete modes of operation. And, and we want to make sure we have safety at that level. And so it turns out that for palm DPs, you can actually write down a discrete time nonlinear dynamical system representing the evolution of the palm DP. This is work by my, my postdoc, Reza. And once we have that discrete time system, we can define barrier functions for the discrete time system. And we can have a theorem, just like with the continuous time version, where we can guarantee forward invariance of a set for this discrete time dynamical system. And what this allows us to do is modify policies, that is the evolution of the 
Palm DP in a way that will guarantee safety, even when this Palm DP is representing multiple agents working together to achieve a goal. So by safety, I mean, don't hit these obstacles in the space and work collaboratively to achieve this goal. So, so that's that integration step. And, and we've actually studied this a lot more recently. These are a bunch of, of papers we just submitted to ICRA, exactly working on different aspects of this problem that I don't have time to talk about, but I wanna just kind of point out these papers and the students that were involved in the work and postdocs uh, at this planning layer uh, in the context of safety. So in my remaining few minutes though, I wanna jump ahead. Oh, I, I just wanna note that per my background, the goal is to get all this to work on legged robots as well. Uh, we haven't done that in a real integrative way yet, but this is the kind of behavior we'd like to have uh, is multi-robot systems, including legged robots that collaborate in a safe and autonomous fashion. Okay, so, so let me close this talk in the last couple of minutes by, by talking about a really important application, which is robotic assisted devices. Uh, so thus far, we've established sort of all the theory. And now we get to see that theory in action. Um, so the idea is actually really simple. Uh, and it makes a ton of sense. Basically, if you want to get somebody to walk who can't walk, let's use our understanding of walking, that is on walking robots like Cassie, to help them walk. So that's exactly what's happening here. And I'll be more explicit in a second, but basically all of the math that went into making Cassie walk um, is sitting under the surface here. So this device, which I'll talk about in a minute, is a lower body exoskeleton that's meant for paraplegics that can't walk at all, no function of their legs. And we're able to generate stable dynamic trajectories on this system using the ideas we've generated for these systems, that is legged robots. So, so let me start by showing this process on a prosthetic. Um, so this is work by my graduate student, Rachel Geller, and this is a prosthetic in my lab. It's uh, built by my students, actually, it's a custom built prosthetic. And what we can do is model the prosthetic and the human as a single system. We can generate gates for this unified system. This is the simulation of the gates we generate. And then we can use the generated gates together with control Lyapunov function based controllers on the device itself to get stable walking with the prosthetic. And so we've done this for, for many years through a variety of papers. This is an example of this in action where the stable gates we generated are, are running on the device and multiple uh, human subjects, that is graduate students uh, wearing the device and walking around campus showing that you can actually walk outside with it. And recently, uh, we actually implemented CLF specifically, that is model-based control up and off functions, uh, using force estimation at the socket to get dynamic, locomo dynamic walking on the prosthetic. So that's my student, Rachel, uh, walking around campus using this CLF QP running on board the device here, using a model-dependent version of it uh, to locomote. So, so I think this is cool because this is really an instantiation of the theory I talked about earlier, CLF QPs on the device in practice. And you and the end result is you get much better tracking. You get much better performance by using these uh, more advanced nonlinear controllers. So that's sort of the context for what we're doing. Now, let me jump to the exoskeleton front. So we have this exoskeleton in my lab and we're very fortunate to have it. It's built by a French company, Wondercraft. And uh, it did an amazing job designing this device. And the great thing about this device is it's meant to work in a, in a way such that you have dynamic walking on it. That is most exoskeletons to date that you see around the for lower limb, um, most lower limb exoskeletons use crutches. So the crutches are actually an integral part of the device, meaning that it can't walk without those crutches. So this device is built to walk or work without crutches. And the way it works, and we've actually collaborated with Wondercraft for many years now, me as well as Jesse Grizzle at Michigan, is it uses the same mathematics that we have on walking robots on the device. So let me, let me explain that. So it turns out it's this theorem that's the basic core too. This theorem, because it's a fully actuated walking robot in essence, right? So this is, uh, it, this is the device now with nobody in it. And the point is if we can get the exoskeleton to walk with nobody in it, stably, dynamically, as if it was just a robot, when you put somebody in it who can't walk, they can walk stably with it. So this is the device walking now as a walking robot. So a standalone, 3D walking robot running the same. Now the algorithms were all developed by Wondercraft, but the math under the, under the hood is the same math I was talking about earlier. And now you can put a paraplegic in it. So this, this, this human subject is a complete paraplegic, meaning no function of his legs and hasn't walked for about 10 years now. And in the device, 
he's able to walk along with a lot of other subjects in the device dynamically without the use of crutches. So to me, this is a really, uh, a really cool connection between the math all the way down to, to an incarnation of the math that can actually help people like, live better lives and gain some mobility back. So that's the trajectory I, I think is really cool. Okay, so going on though, the great thing is we have one of these in our lab so we can do a bunch of stuff on it now. We can, we can not just get stable walking but actually play around with applying all these different control algorithms to the device. So I'm just gonna highlight a couple applications and, and then I'll, I'll conclude the talk. But I think it's, it's cool to see these ideas instantiated. So one, one, one idea is variable assistance. That is, we wanna allow somebody who maybe has some function of their legs to use the device. And the way we do this is through control barrier functions. So what we do is we take a nominal trajectory that we had on the device for a stable walking gait for let's say complete assistance. And then we take a tube around it and that defines our barrier function, this tube. And we can sort of relax how much you can move within the tube based on the barrier function, based on sort of the strength of this gamma, if you'd like. This term here is how aggressively you're assisting somebody. And we're able to actually show that we can vary the assistance on the device, that is have the human use some of their, their muscle function or none of their muscle function, depending on how we change this controller and how we realize the control barrier function. So that's one connection with the theory. Um, another connection with the theory is, is this learning plus control intersection. This is in a slightly different form I, I talked about earlier, but, but the ideas are kind of similar. So in this case, what's happening, and I'm illustrating this on a walking robot first to really show what's happening is we use preference-based learning. That is any given moment, we look at two different gates on the walking robot. And we say, which one of these gates do we like better? Based on the betterness of that, we can actually converge in on the best gate meaning we can determine what gate is better and better over time. And applying this to, the, to, to Amber, the robot in the lab, we're, actually, we're able to generate these really stable gates by picking between these gates using this preference-based learning framework. The same idea can be applied to the exoskeleton. So now what's, what we do is we have this gate library of gates and we run a gate and we ask the person if they like that gate better than the other gate. And over time, we build up this sort of understanding of what gates they like uh, and we're ultimately able to characterize those gates to certain degrees to understand which gate an individual subject will prefer. Uh, and we can look at different aspects of those gates to understand, you know, do they like dynamic walking gates? Do they like gates with bigger step width or smaller step width? Uh, and, and use this to customize the gate to the individual subject. So the goal is to ultimately take all of those ideas and translate them to a clinical context. Uh, so this is just this, the, the, a single gate, meaning gates generated per subject. This isn't using the preference-based learning, but I'm just kind of closing with this video to show that we can do a lot with the data we're getting in from uh, clinical trials of these ideas on, uh, um, on the exoskeleton. So again, this is, this is showing clinical trials with multiple different human subjects walking with the exoskeleton. The important point here is this is actually be run by clinicians, not engineers. That is, the, the exoskeleton is now stable enough that you don't need an engineer in the room to run it, a clinician could do it. And we can collect data from all of this and really understand how we might want to improve the gates, how we might want to improve the math. So it's that loop between theory and practice we can understand in these application domains. That is this loop here I talked about, this bridging the gap between theory and practice, if I can go back, uh, is, is, has real ramifications to a variety of domains. That is, we can bridge this gap and close this divide in the context of walking robots, like I talked about earlier, in the context of safety critical systems, and also in the context of things like exoskeletons, right? And as we progressively bridge this gap, and get closer and closer coupling between the theory and the practical realization of that theory, we can get ever better performance out of our robotic systems. So to me, the biggest bottleneck in robotic systems is now, and will be for the foreseeable future, our mathematical understanding of those systems. The hardware we have now is more than capable to do all the things we want it to do, really, by and large. It's just, are we smart enough to figure out the math on the surface? So here's that same root system I showed you earlier, the one that Cassie fell on. And this is a recent result just submitted to ICRA. And you'll see we handle this same root system and it just walks over it like it isn't even there. And, and the importance of this is that we improved our theory. That's why it's doing this. 
This was not a result of exhaustive testing to try to tune to this route. Rather, we went back and we generated better and better walking gates and improved our mathematical understanding of the system, improved our uh, realization of controllers. And the end result is we can now handle something that we couldn't do before with ease. And it's that process that we want to do again and again and again in a variety of different application domains from walking robots to exoskeletons and everything in between, because the goal is really to get robots out there. And I think that's the operative thing is, is take all this math, all this theory, all this understanding, put it on real physical systems, and in the end, have these wonderful couplings between robots and people as they work together. So with that, thank you very much for the invitation and for listening to the presentation. Fantastic, thanks so much, Aaron. Um, that was a real whirlwind tour of so many different physical systems controlled with, um, you know, really unified methods is super exciting. What questions do people have? Yeah, I know I covered a lot of space. It's always hard not to, to, to talk about all the things I'm excited. So hopefully <laughs> there's a thread through it all uh, that was, that was, that was compelling. Yeah, and so folks should feel free to, you're welcome to unmute and speak up, uh, kind of interject. You can also type in questions on the chat or do a little Zoom emote to raise your hand and I can call on you. Hey, this is Eric. Um, are you excited about any particular things about perception? Yes. Perception is really interesting um, and something I'm, I'm definitely excited about uh, right now. Uh, we just actually had our first paper uh, starting to think about perception in a safety critical context. Uh, that's actually was presented at Coral today at, at uh, 1015, so I didn't get to watch it. And it's joint work with uh, Sarah Dean at, at Berkeley, who's a student of Ben Recht. Uh, so we're starting to understand how you would take vision modules, learned vision modules, and put them in this safety critical loop, right? Or perception being an operative one. And, and I think it's a really fascinating problem because perception typically operates sort of at different loop rates than your safety critical control algorithm. So you have to understand how to mitigate those different loop rates. And the question we're sort of asking is, do you wanna do the typical perception stack or computer vision stack? you know, where you sort of have a camera, feature points, et cetera, et cetera, or are there things you can do that's very specific to safety? That is, can you look at very specific signals coming from a camera, let's say, or another sensor? And perception can sort of be broadly defined uh, that, that in such a way that you're looking at only signals that matter with regard to the safety, right? So you can imagine, again, if you want to avoid an obstacle, like I showed earlier the drone with the onboard camera, the way that was working is the camera there was, was doing feature point extraction and doing some, you know, getting some depth, est depth estimation, everything. All that process was going through. But that creates a bunch of uncertainty because, again, the loop rates are slower. It gives you way more information than you need. What you really just need is how far am I from the wall? So, so understanding that information that you're getting from a perception module. And then the other thing is, how do you propagate uncertainty in that information into the safety critical control context? So that's what our coral paper was on, was how, when you have uncertainty in that module, how do you mitigate that uncertainty in, in a robust way? And specifically, the paper was on measurement robust control barrier functions. That is, you want to be robust to measurement error in a safety critical context. And so you want to sort of modulate this inequality so it compensates for this uncertainty that's being propagated through the feedback loop via measurements, generally speaking, perception being a specific example. So I think there's a whole, this is just a couple uh, touch points, but I think this is a hugely interesting area is what role does sensing play in safety critical control? Because you could not sit there and pretend that you have X, meaning your state, and you're going to get X at exactly the loop rate your controller is running, right? The, the truth is so different. And you can't just slap a common filter on it and say you're done. I think that's not sufficient either. So I think you really need to understand how perception is playing a role in the signals you're getting in a robust way. Well, you Great could question. do that. That's what we've been doing for decades. Yes, <laughs> yes. It just won't work. Yes, yes, exactly, yeah. So no, I think there's, 
there's huge opportunities and, and huge ways of building on the work of the past. Of course, I'm not trying to pretend we can't build on it all, but I think we need to really think about, no, I think, I think that the future in safety critical control in my mind is all about integration cross layer, cross sensor, cross platform, right? Meaning it's no longer developing these things in isolation and slapping them together, but it's rather understanding at this really integrated level how they interact. And that makes a huge difference. That's what we found to be the ultimate deal maker, if you'd like, uh, in getting stuff to work on hardware is thinking across all these layers in a holistic way. Great question. What other questions do people have? This is Eric. So um, a question about um, learning, and I may have missed how you described the learning part of your talk. Um, so you look at the kind of things that people are doing with like deep reinforcement learning and these kinds of robots. Mm -hmm. um, they come up with a policy and the policy basically, you know, in, in a way could be thought of as learning some combination of safety of barrier um, functions and the optimal functions mm -hmm. um, is, uh, or maybe it should be or could be um, in the sense of if you could put a formal framework on the structure of um, policies that could be learned so that they were required to somehow be a combination of barrier and, yeah. and safety and maybe reachability or something. Right. Um, is, there a, is there an opportunity there or is there already work in that? Um, yeah, I, I think there's huge opportunities there. Uh, I mean, and there's, there's work in that, in that space uh, in general. Um, you know, there's, I mean, learning right now is this, is this, monster of work, right? Monster of body of work. Um, and, and there's a whole bunch of philosophies, if you'd like. Um, and, and I think there's opportunity in, in many of the different philosophies, although some more than others. Um, you know, as you noted, when you're talking about learning and, and deep learning, there's a whole bunch of different ways you can, you can talk about, you know, reinforcement learning, you're talking about active learning, you're talking about all these different ways of, uh, and, and in essence, what most learning algorithms do is solve, I, I view learning as simply solving an optimization problem, but without the model, right? It is effectively what they're doing. Um, so when we solve our, our optimization problem for the robot, we have the model and that defines the problem. If you didn't have a model, you're gonna do a feedback loop to solve this optimization where your function calls are no longer calling a function, but they're calling data, which is telling you the next step to take, right? Uh, and, and so that's sort of, if you viewed learning from this end-to-end -end perspective, that's sort of what it's doing. Um, and I think, by the way, I think end-to-end -end learning is, is inherently flawed concept um, in that if you just do learning without uh, notions of structure, you're, you're not going to have sufficient information to be robust. Um, and, and so, you know, if you look at sort of the success stories, it's, it's, Let's, let's learn, you know, let's do some sort of reinforcement learning or some variant thereof and pop it on the hardware. The successful ones, effectively what it amounts to is generating a trajectory if you'd like. Or, or you know, you could think about it as a policy and a whole bunch of other stuff, but I view it as kind of a trajectory generation method. Uh, and then you track that on hardware and it can work, but you're, you're ignoring a whole bunch of structure that's hugely helpful. You know, like I said, or I just said to the previous response, the real secret sauce to getting stuff to work on hardware is integrating cross layer in a structured way and using the benefits of every given method in any given layer to, to your, to your own, you know, uh, benefit. Right. And so what I mean is if you have a model, use the model. If you don't have a model, use learning, right. Understand that interaction between them. And, and so, you know, the, the ways we've done learning, like, when I mentioned learning with barrier functions is we did learning, but we didn't, instead of learning the entire model or instead of learning a, an error term on the model, an unknown part of the model, we learned an unknown part of the barrier function because what we cared about was safety. So, so that's sort of saying, let's look and learn the thing that we really care about or, or learn the thing that's preventing us from doing what we want based on the model we have. And there's a whole bunch of other ways you could do that. Again, perception is a great example. You know, perception, there's going to be learning layers in that perception. So the question is, how do you integrate that perception and the learning at the perception level 
with a robot. And you probably don't want to say, I'm going to do learning for my perception, then I'm going to do end-to-end -end learning on my robot, and I'm just going to learn everywhere. I'm just going to throw it all in this big thing and run it and, and good to go, right? I, I, you're, you're going to just, it's just not going to, it's just not going to work efficiently, you know? Um, you know, and so what we did, for example, in the, in the Amber example I showed you, there we were doing preference-based learning. So we were doing learning to, in essence, learn the cost function associated with the walking. But what we were modifying in the learning were constraints in the optimization. So what we were saying is we have this walking robot and we generate a walking gate. But what we usually do when we generate a walking gate is tweak these constraints because the first time we generate a gate, it wouldn't work. So we'd maybe make the foot go a little higher or make the knee go a little straighter. Or, you know, we play with all these little things until we finally got something to work on hardware, right? So it was this manual tuning in the optimization. So we use learning to do that manual tuning. And it was super effective and we got it to work with really unknown models. Right. So again, if you, I think, I think it's all about strategically framing the learning. If you're going to do reinforcement learning, you can use model components to that. You can also add safety critical concepts to it. There is safety critical reinforcement learning that's been done. I mean, you know, reinforcement learning can almost be viewed as the evolution of a discrete time dynamical system. And you can add, uh, you know, concepts from control theory and the evolution of that discrete time dynamical system. So what I'm saying is I think in integration is key in essence. I mean, I can't answer this question in any reasonable time frame, but, but the, the, the short answer is use the strengths of a given method on what it's good for and then use uh, that in a complementary way with other methods, right? I don't know if that answered your question, but it it, it it is an answer to your question. Yeah, no, it's an interesting set of things to think about. And, and I think it's interesting to think about how, you know, because to some extent, um, a lot of the language of Lyapunov functions and barrier functions is different than the language of, um, of, of say, reinforcement learning um, and policies and things like that. But ultimately, um, you can make the robots do similar things with the two things. And, and there are, like you say, strengths and weaknesses to each um, set of methods. And so a unifying framework that allowed you to talk about all that stuff together yes. um, would be nice. I mean, my frustration often is that the, the, in learning, you're often learning something where you have a lot of structure, but you don't have a language to put that structure mm -hmm. into the blank slate model that you're starting with, because right. we know how to start with blank slate models and do something there or we know how to start with very sort of bespoke models mm -hmm. um, but then we don't know how to put in a really generic learning framework into that right yeah yeah and you're exactly right is i think this is the conversation that should be had is how do you take the respective strengths of these methods and the and the way in which describing problems via these methods and really integrate them at a deep level i guess that's that's the future of learning for dynamical systems in my mind, right? Or for highly dynamic systems. Any other questions folks have? I have a question concerning uh, involving users or um, um, human input. Mm -hmm. um, I'm kind of having trouble framing this in my own mind, but at a certain point, once you introduce a human to this, you are going to be uh, dealing with the issue of, you know, when you're departing from the lane, eventually saying to the human, the human is wrong um, and not allowing certain sorts of types of decisions to occur. Um, sure. How do you uh, like algorithmically handle that? Or do you just like allow the human to make wrong decisions with a certain machine and the other machines accommodate around that? Yeah, so you are you are right that what you're doing is, is, is you look at what you do here is you look at the human decision, let's say driving, right? In this case, and you don't want to let them leave the lane. You look at their input at any given moment. And what the barrier function does is give you a way of checking whether that input is safe or not instantaneously, because it operates on derivatives of the dynamics. Um, and if that input is safe, you say, go ahead and do that. If it's not safe, what you do is say, okay, let me, let me, I'm gonna take that input and minimally modify it. That's find the closest input that is safe to the one you want it to do. And that's the one we're gonna do. So in essence, you're overriding the human, you're, you're filtering the human inputs in a way that's always forcing a safe decision on the back end, but, but in a way that minimally modifies what they wanted to do on the front end. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you.
Well, if I can be selfish, um, and Aaron, if you still have a few minutes, I know we're a little over time. Uh, I'd kind of like to riff on Eric's question from the middle of the presentation. Um, not to throw yet another framework into the mix, but the uh, way I understood his question was, okay, if I start um, you know, throwing up these barrier functions to ensure safety, I may, for instance, be, be preventing the task that I wanted to accomplish from being accomplishable. Yep. And so, you know, the, the set of methods that I'm aware of that has the, has the kind of strongest guarantees on um, being correct by construction or something are these like LTL formal methods type controllers. And so I wondered if you could comment on um, the poss you know, the possibility for an integration with those kinds of things or, you know, different routes to, uh, gear, you know, ensuring correctness of a, of a synthesized, of a yeah. safe controller? Yeah, no, that, that's a great question. Um, so from the formal method side, it turns out that there are, there's a whole series of really great papers on doing formal methods with barrier functions now. There's work coming out of Georgia Tech, Magnus Eggerstadt had some papers on this, work out of KTH, uh, Demos has a series of wonderful papers on this. Um, Colin Belta, I think has a couple papers now, and actually, I have a couple papers out of my group on this. Um, it turns out that if you consider STL, signal temporal logic, uh, there are fragments of STL that can be represented as combinations of barrier function constraints. Um, meaning you can effectively say, if I want to eventually go somewhere, right? Eventually always, you could see eventually always as being uh, a combination of two barrier functions, right? So eventually means I want to get there at some point. So you can have sort of a, in, in essence, that's a Lyapunov function, but it simultaneously is a barrier function. You can even do a finite time Lyapunov function if you want to get there. Oh, also out of Michigan, um, there's, a, there's some work on this as well that's really good. Um, and then once you get there, the always, right, um, you know, is simply a, a barrier function cons constraint as well. So it turns out that now you can't cover all of STL. In fact, in general, uh, LTL cannot be described by Lyapunov-like functions, period, end of sentence, meaning that you can't capture all specifications. But there are fragments, like always eventually kind of fragments, that you can't capture. And it turns out that barrier functions allow you to capture those in a way that Lyapunov functions actually didn't. So you can get a larger fragment of sort of formal languages in that context. Um, and so there, there's definitely some nice connections there. Um, there's, uh, there's also connections with um, uh, distribution temporal logic uh, at the palm DP level. So it turns out that again, with these discrete time barriers, I, it, actually the paper I had cited there, uh, you can capture a whole bunch of fragments of DTL also with these uh, discrete time barrier functions uh, and finite time variations thereof. So there's a whole world, I, I'm sort of throwing out a bunch of stuff, but there's a whole world of interesting connections. Um, it's currently being a pretty active area in the formal methods community. Uh, these connections between, because it's allowing us, to, it's allowing a different take. So traditionally people would approach formal methods and specifications by let's abstract our system dynamics to a discrete time system, let's do model checking on that and let's bring it back down. It turns out you can sort of barrier functions because they're sort of set theoretic based, allow you to skip that abstraction step. And, and you can just operate sort of purely at the, at the, the set invariance or, re, or set reachability kind of level, right? Um, so so that's, that's sort of a quick answer there. Um, but uh, with the risk of confusion, going back to Eric's original question, you have to understand that balancing multiple barriers or balancing stability, Lyapunov plus a barrier is a complicated thing, right? You aren't guaranteed if you enforce three barriers simultaneously or enforce a barrier plus a Lyapunov that it will be satisfiable. So you have to make sure that you have satisfiability as part of these considerations. Makes Does that sense. answer your question though? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Uh, this is probably getting way too deep into the weeds, but is there a result on the thing that you said that there are uh, LTL specs that cannot be realized with Lyapunov functions? Because yeah. I've had this question for a long time. Yeah, so so I I, um, I know this from Paulo Taboada. Okay. Who has a counterexample that he showed me at the time. Okay. 
I, I don't have a specific reference, but I cool. would say Paulo Taboada can tell you a counter example. Okay, cool. I'll try to, I'll try to uh, and, corner and at him. At the time, I was totally convinced, um, you know, so that, that I, I, then I paired him from that point on. Uh, cool. But yeah, there, that, that's, uh, yeah, he, he would know the answer to that better than me. I'm, I'm okay, not I'll, a formal methods person per se, right? So I can't. Sure, sure. I'll try to corner him over a coffee or a beer the next time. You should. It, it would be in, very, in 2022 when those things are. Right, when those things happen again. <laughs> Track down Apollo and, and ask him for for a proof that not all uh, of STL can be represented with Lyapunov-like conditions. It's it's related to the memoryless aspect of feedback control. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Cool. Um. Okay, we're we're quite a bit over time now, so I know people are going to have to drop off, and I want to be respectful of your time too, Aaron. Um, but thanks again for uh, giving us this fantastic talk and uh, answering so many of these questions that people have. My pleasure. Thanks for the invite. It was I I, I love UW, so you know it's uh, it's been a pleasure to talk. And again, hopefully at some point I can visit physically and see the labs and talk to grad students and do all that fun stuff in the yeah. distant future. So that would be fantastic. Great. All right, thanks. Yeah, thanks so much. Bye Stay everyone. healthy. Yes. Yeah.